Hello and how are you? Hey friends, it's me again, Shenandoah Briscoe, coming to you live right here in St. Charles, Missouri. Yes, sir, home of the ice sculpture competition. Yes, sir, we're going to have a big old major ice sculpture competition this here on the uh, September uh, 30th, that Saturday, September 30th, down in the uh, 100 block of North Main Street. Right down here, boy, I tell you what, they're going to take them blocks of ice and they're going to get out their chainsaws. And they're going to start carving. And they're going to carve out some different uh, statuettes and stuff of that love nature with the ice. So, come on down and enjoy the festivities. You're going to love it because, well, hey, that's just what they do. You know what I'm saying? That's just what they do. Carve up your ice. Make it look good. Boy, I've been having muscle spasms right and left for the last 20 minutes. Boy, driving me nuts, driving me nuts here. And then I took another extra muscle relaxer today, and it's, it's kind of starting to kick in. Got my body all in a... Uh, In a predicament. Uh, sorry about that. I gotta move this chair up a little bit. There we go. Yeah, and then I'm gonna take a little drink of this water over here. Well, I thought I was. Come on up, y'all. There we go. Had to have a drink. Yes, sir, I did, I did. That's just the way she works, you know. After a while, if you don't have you a drink of the nectar, then your mouth gets pretty dry. And if your mouth gets pretty dry, well, then you don't have a drink of the nectar. All right, hey, I started this story yesterday, so I'm going to try to go back and find that same story and uh, see if we can't get her dead. All right. All right. Give me a second. Well, I think. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. This is where we left off yesterday. You know, we were talking about the dog and the dog had learned that fire had and, uh, and it wanted fire or else to bury its head under the snow and cuddle in its warmth away from the air. Well, the fuller's frozen moisture of its breath, of its breathing, had settled on its fur in a fine powder of frost, and especially where its jaws, muzzle, and eyelashes whitened by, the, uh, by its crystalled breath. Yeah, the man's red beard and mustache were likewise frosted, but more solidly. The deposits taking the form of ice and icing with every warm, moist breath he exhaled. Also, the man was chewing tobacco, and the muzzle of... Uh, what? Chewing tobacco? Bucky and the muzzle of ice had his lips so rigidly that he was unable to clear his chin when he expelled the juices. Now, the result was that a crystal beard of the color and solidarity of amber was increasing its length on his chin. Now, if he fell down, it would shatter itself like glass into brittle fragments, but he did not mind the uh, appendage. It was the penalty of all tobacco chewers paid in the, that country, and he had been out before in two cold snaps. They had not been so cold as this, he knew, but by the 
spirit thermometer in at 60 mile, he knew they had been registered at 50 below and at 55. About to lose my sight here, folks. He held on, though. The level stretch of woods for several miles across the wide, wide flat of Niger Heads and dropped down a bank to the frozen bed of a small stream. This was Henderson Creek, and he knew he was 10 miles from the forks. He looked at his watch, and it was 10 o'clock. He was making four miles an hour, and he calculated that he would arrive at the forks at half past twelve. He decided to calibrate, oh, celebrate that event by eating his lunch right there. The dog dropped against him at his heels and was a tail droop discouragement that the man swung along the creek bed. The furrow of the old sled trail was plenty very visible, but a dozen inches of snow covered the marks of the last runners. In a month, no man had come up or down <laughs> that silent creek. The man had steadily, the man held steadily on. He was not much given to taking, to thinking, and just then, particularly, he had nothing, nobody to talk, nothing to do, think about, save that he would eat lunch at the Forks, and that at six o'clock he would be in camp with the boys. There was nobody to talk to, and had there been speech would have been impossible because the ice muzzle on his mouth so he continued monotonously to chew tobacco and to increase the length of his amber beard. Alright, hey, I'm going to have to pause out for a minute because losing my eyesight which means I'm getting very tired and uh, I'll uh, take a quick nap and I'll get right back to you, okay? Okay, hold on. Alright, we're going to start over again. Not over, but pick up again where we left off. Well, once in a while, the thought retired itself that it was very cold and that he had never experienced such cold. As he walked along, he rubbed his cheekbones and nose with the back of his mitted hand. He did this automatically, now and again changing hands, but rubbed as he would, the instant he stopped, his cheekbones went numb, and the following instant, the ends of his nose went numb. He was sure to frost his cheeks. He knew that, he knew that, and experienced of pang of regret that he had not devised a nose strap of some sort. But worn in the cold snaps. Uh, bud worn in the cold snaps. Huh. Such a strap passed across the cheeks as well and saved them. But it didn't matter much after all. What were frosted cheeks? A bit painful, that was all. And they were never serious. Empty as the man's mind was of the thought, he was keenly observant, and he noticed the change in the creek, the curves and the bends and the timbers jams, and always he sharply noted where he placed his feet. Once coming around a bend, he shied abruptly like a startled horse, curved away from the place where he had been walking and 
retreated several paces back along the trail. The, cheek, the creek, he knew, was frozen clear to the bottom, and no creek w could contain water in the Arctic winter. But he knew also that there was a spring that bubbled out from the hillside and ran along under the snow and a, on top of the ice of the creek. He knew that the coldest snaps never froze that spring, and he knew likewise their danger. There were traps. They hid pools of water under the snow that might be there three inches deep or three feet deep. Sometimes a skin of ice half an inch thick covered them and it turn, and in turn was covered by the snow. Sometimes there were, they were alternated la layers of water and ice, ice skin. So, when one broke through, he kept on breaking through for a while. Sometimes wetting himself to the waist, and that was why he had shielded in such panic. He had felt the give under his feet and heard the crack of a snow-hidden ice skin, and to get his feet wet in such a temperature might meant trouble and danger. At the very latest, it meant delay, and for he would be forced to stop, build a fire, and under its protection to bare his feet, while he dried his socks and moccasins. He stood and studied the creek bed and its banks, and decided that the flow of water came from right, from the right. He reflected a while, rubbing his nose and cheeks, then skirted to the left, stepping gingerly and testing the footing for each step. Once clear of the danger, he took a fresh jaw of tobacco and swung along at its four mile gate at his four mile gate. In the course of the next two hours he came upon several similar traps. Usually the snow above the hidden pools had sunken. Candid appearances sunken candid appearances that advertised the danger. Once again, however, he had a close call, and once speculating danger, he compelled the dog to go on in front. The dog did not want to do so. Uh, he, it hung back until the man shoved it forward, and then it went quickly across the white, unbroken surface. Suddenly it broke through, floundered, on, floundered to one side, and got away to firmer footing. It had wet its forefeet and legs, and almost immediately the water that clung to it turned to ice. It made quicker efforts to lick the ice off its legs, then dropped down in the snow and began to bite out the ice that had formed between its toes. Now this was a matter of instinct. To permit the ice to remain would mean sore feet, and it did not. It didn't know this. It merely obeyed the mis mysteries, prompting that arose from the deep crepes of its being. But the man knew, having achieved a judgment of the subject, and he removed the mittens from his right hand and helped tear out the ice particles. He did not expose his fingers more than a minute, and was astonished at the swift num numbness that smote them, and it certainly was cold. He pulled on the mitten hastily and beat the hands savagely across his chest. Okay, I think that's enough for today. We will get back to it at another time. Anyway, hey, that is about my time, so hey, goodbye, my friends. It's time to go. 
Yes, goodbye, my friends. It's time to go. I hate to leave you, but I really must go. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye. Well, this here's Shenandoah Briscoe saying hello and how are you? You know, God loves you and so do I. So, be blessed in Jesus' name and come back and see me tomorrow. All right. Well, all righty then. I'll be here. I hope you are too.